welcome everyone. Well, it depends on where you are. Good morning or good uh, good evening. So uh, this is the uh, ASPA section on Chinese public administration's uh, research talk series with uh, Professor Wang Ryzen. Okay. So uh, my name is uh, Zhi Wei Zhang, and I work as an associate professor at Kansas State University. So I will be your host and uh, coordinator for today's talk. All right. So before we start today's talk, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give a like uh, from the uh, the previous talks, I'm going to give a pretty uh, brief introduction about ASPA, as well as our section on Chinese public administration. And afterwards, I'm going to introduce the uh, the the speaker of the night uh, to you guys. And the uh, first off, so the uh, ASPA it stands for American Society for Public Administration. So ASPA's primary function is to serve as the uh, the critical bridge between public administration scholarship and practitioners in the field. So all of our service and programs are geared towards supporting our society's goal to advance the art, science, teaching, and practice of public and nonprofit administration. Okay, so as part of the discipline's leading public service organization, ASPA's leadership and members promote the value of joining and evaluating the public service profession uh, build bridges among all who pursue public purpose at home and internationally, provide networking and professional development opportunities those committed to public uh, service values, achieve innovation solutions to the challenge of governance. And in particular, our section, section on Chinese public administration was established in uh, April 26, uh, 2006, and uh, consists of scholars and practitioners from the US China and other countries. It is the, uh, the largest professional and scholarly organization in the field of Chinese public administration and public affairs in the US. So um, SP, uh, SCPA, our section collaborates closely with the uh, Chinese Public Administration Society and facilitates, uh, facilitates cooperation with schools of public affairs and administration in China and their counterparts in the US. All right. so. Um, the uh, the section chair Elaine uh, Elaine Lu cannot be here tonight, so uh, I will I will give you guys a a uh, I'll, I'll be the uh, the the one to introduce you to Professor Greg Van Ryzen. All right, so Dr. Greg Van Ryzen is a professor in the School of Public Affairs and Administration at Rutgers University, New York, where he is also. If uh, if I think uh, if I'm right, it's also the uh, the director of the Center for Experimental and Behavioral Public Administration, and he has interests in both survey research and experimental method, and conducts empirical studies on a range of topics, including citizen satisfaction with urban services, co-production, measurement, nonprofit organizations, housing and neighborhood issues and the comparative public opinions about government policy and institutions. He is a, uh, also a founding uh, editor together with Sebastian Jalk and Kameya, which we also have the, uh, the pleasure to, to work with from the, uh, the previous talk, and of the, uh, the Journal of Behavior Public Administration, a not-for-profit open access journal. Uh, Dr. Van Ryzen is widely published, uh, published in uh, scholarly journals in public administration, Policy Analysis and Urban Affairs, and is the author of Research Method in Practice. All right, so uh, before I turn the floor to, uh, to uh, Dr. Van Ryzen, so we have a, a couple announcements, okay? So the, the talk is going to last for an hour, roughly for an hour and 15 minutes, okay? Like I said, I'll be your coordinator tonight. So the uh, the uh, professor Van Rising is going to give us a talk for roughly an hour. And during during his talk, and um, please feel free to to utilize the chat box in Zoom. Okay, so if you have any clarification questions, if you have any uh, research related questions, feel free to tap that in the chat box. All right, I will be monitoring the the, uh, the chat box as we go along, and. Um, also, if you have clarification questions, feel free to speak up or send me a, a direct message. I will ask uh, uh, Professor Van Ryzen to, to answer those questions. Uh, as he said, he's okay to stop and uh, explain things. All right, we don't have to wait until the last minute for the Q and A section. And that would be it. All right, Professor uh, Van Ryzen, the floor is yours. All right. Well, well, thank thank you, Zhiwei, and 
Um, I, I really appreciate the invitation. Um, thank you for hosting this. And uh, thanks to Hanjin too for organizing everything. And Hanjin's a doctoral student in our, in our program at Rutgers University in Newark. So it's uh, um, good, good to see her kind of involved in, in organizing these events and, and being a, an important part of your, your section. I also want to thank uh, Elaine Yilu, because I, I know um, she, she was uh, kind enough to kind of suggest this invitation. And um, I realized she had a conflict and couldn't be here, but I just wanted to thank her also for, you know, for chairing the section and for inviting me to be part of this talk. Um, and I uh, look forward to it and I um, send my greetings to all, all of you um, um, who got up this morning and took time out of your Saturday morning to, to be here. Um, um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to share these ideas. I mean, I've, 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 um, I'm gonna talk a bit of just kind of broadly about the use of experiments in, in public administration research and, and uh, give you sort of my, my perspective on the design and analysis of experiments. Um, a lot of this I've learned you know, through trial and error, just through my own experience. I should give a little bit of background about myself. I think to, um, I'm, a, I'm a psychologist by training. I, I got into public administration by doing survey research and program evaluations. I got my PhD in 1991 and I, I worked in Washington, DC and, and worked on a lot of survey uh, um, um, projects for the federal government. I also worked on program evaluations that were both kind of quasi-experimental and experimental. And I directed a survey research center for a number of years. After, after being in Washington, I went to New York City and I, I was at Baruch College in New York City for about 10 years before coming to Rutgers. And I ran a survey research center there. And we, we, used, we began using experiments in, in the context of doing surveys to test question wording and kind of you know, uh, better ways to ask questions and get unbiased answers. And then it was around um, around 2000 or so that I began kind of applying experiments more to substantive in issues in, 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 in my own research rather than just kind of methodological issues around question wording. Um, so um, I kind of got, you know, and, and as a psychologist, because my PhD was in psychology, I had, I had a fair amount of you know, training in, in experimental methods, that's kind of the standard method in psychology. Um, I didn't um, think it would be that useful in public administration and, until I kind of got into doing more of the survey experimental work that I began in the early 2000s. I also kind of, at, at that same period, sort of around, um, you know, the, in the early 2000s, I, was, I began kind of getting more and more interested in online research too, as a kind of emerging way of contacting people and get, gathering survey data because telephone surveys and more traditional methods were experiencing problems with contacts and kind of cooperation rates and online methods were emerging as kind of a, a, a major alternative and, um, and, and implementing experiments in the context of online surveys is uh, relatively uh, uh, more flexible because of software can, that can be programmed to randomize the order of questions and the wording of questions and the presentation of materials to respond. So anyway, so that, 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 that's what kind of got me into this line of work. And um, so, um, so let me just share this with you. I, I kind of, so the way I'm, I'm presenting this talk is kind of, first of all, kind of a, let me just give you kind of an overview. I'm gonna first talk about sort of the rationale for experiments in public administration research. Like why, why, why should there be experiments in public administration? And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the um, logic of, of, of an experiment. And, and, and I know this may be kind of uh, elementary for some of you, but I also think it's, it's fundamental to understand what, what an experiment is and how it differs from traditional methods of research, which are more observational. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some variations in the design and setting of experiments, because there's lots of types of experiments. There's experiments in, you know, in, the, in the lab or in the field, and there's different sort of um, um, features and, and complications to experiments and different kinds of participants. So we'll, I'll talk a bit about that. And then, and then, and then just a, a, a little bit also on the actual practicalities of conducting experiments, like um, you know, kind of um, how to design them, what some of the software that's used for experiments, where to find samples or participants. 
Um, and then I'm going to uh, talk about analyzing and publishing experiments because there's some in interesting and important issues in how to analyze experiments. In some ways, they're, they're simpler than than other observational studies. In some ways, they have their own complexities. And 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 there's a lot of challenges in publishing experiments because they're 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 a little more difficult to publish in some ways. And but also, I, I think you know there's a lot of interest in public publishing experiments. Uh, these days. So I'll, I'll give you just sort of my um, advice on that from, you know, my own experience doing this. Um, and then if there's time, um, I'm going to give you an example from some recent research, not that, you know, it's a perfect study or anything like that, but just give you an example of how I kind of came about doing a recent experiment and, and some of the steps I went through. And then, then we'll, you know, we'll have some time for question and answer at uh, Q and A at the end. Um, I, I do want to point out to reinforce what 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 Jiwei said about um, questions. I'm very open to having questions during the talk. I'm fine. I'm fine with being interrupted. Um, I think it would it'd be great to hear hear if if I if I said something that wasn't clear or if you had a question about something or something you wanted me to comment on. If you um, just use the chat chat box function. I've got a little screenshot here of where you find that. You can find the chat box. Uh, you can send. Um, you can type the question in there, and uh, I think Jiwei uh, has kindly agreed to kind of monitor the chat box, and um, he's ha happy to um, uh, interrupt me with a, with a question when the time comes. So I'd be glad to take take questions and hear feedback along the way, um, or. Or, or the questions you could just save them for the end too, and 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 post them there, or you know, un, un, you know, unmute yourself and ask ask a question also. Um, okay, so so that that would be great because I'd I'd love to kind of hear what 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 you you're interested in and what you would like me to comment on and, and answer questions about. Okay, so um, so let me just talk a little bit about sort of where. The origins of experiments in public administration. I think it's it's part of a larger uh, movement, a, a kind of a, a zeitgeist, as they say, like kind of a spirit of the times. Like there, there's experiments, more and more experiments in other disciplines as well that are closely related to public administration. So there's, of course, the important large movement of behavioral economics, which um, um, has brought a lot of experimental work to uh, to the field of economics, which is largely non-experimental up until like the um, you know 1990s or so, um, and um, there's also been a, a really a, a surge of experimental work in political science also, um, which is of course closely related to public administration, and then social and cognitive psychology have always been experimental, but now there's sort of what's kind of interesting is social and cognitive psychology have have sort of contributed more to understanding the uh, the understanding of political and policy and administration issues. And there's even a, a whole field of political psychology that um, kind of uh, relates closely to a lot of the work, the experimental work in, um, in, in public administration. And then as, as many of you know, um, there's also been a movement of, of, of behavioral science and what are called behavioral insights or, or nudge uh, um, approaches to public administration actually in government. So in, in government agencies and in government units, there have been um, um, there have been created these teams of, of behavioral scientists who are doing experiments within the context of actual government administration. And, and the, you know, uh, probably you know, one of the most the earliest and most well-known examples is the behavioral insights team in the in the UK. Um, which has been sometimes labeled the nudge unit. In the United States, um, under the Obama administration, there was a social and behavioral sciences initiative. Um, that, that still exists, but it's in a different, uh, has a different name now, and it's now the Office of Evaluation Sciences, but they still do a large number of uh, applied sort of experimental studies within the federal government. Um, some of the people who started the social and behavioral sciences initiative in the U.S., went into the, the government of Washington, D.C., the local government of the city of Washington, D.C., and formed a group called the Lab at D.C., which is, uh, had some foundation funding, but they, they do a lot of very interesting uh, 
experimental work within the context of um, local government in Washington, DC. Um, there's another well-known group um, um, at Harvard and MIT called the Poverty Action Lab, um, um, J-PAL. They, they, um, they're well-known. In fact, um, Esther Duflo, who is one of the directors of the Poverty Action Lab, recently won the Nobel Prize for her work applying experimental methods to, uh, to uh, international development issues and kind of poverty alleviation in developing countries. Um, and so they, they take a very rigorous um, experimental approach, but applied to um, international um, economic development. There's a behavioral insights group at the World Bank, at the OECD, and other organizations. And then there's other um, uh, nonprofit groups like Ideas42. So, so there, there's a whole world of, of um, applied experimental methods within, within government and in, um, and non um, NGOs and, and international organizations around the world. Um, okay, so <clears throat> um, so along with that, there are I'll just quickly go through this. There are journals, specialized journals now um, that deal with, uh, for example, behavioral public policy. Uh, behavioral science and policy. There's a, a magazine called Behavioral Science um, Scientist. There's the Journal of Behavioral Economics, the Journal of Behavioral Public Administration, which is um, which I helped start with Sebastian Yilka and and, and Ken Meyer, and um, and that that journal has um, you know solely focused kind of on experiments within public administration. But so these journals are all kind of related in, in the sense that they're very they have overlapping kind of interests and content. The Journal of Experimental Political Science too is another one. And then there's some associations that are specialized in this, the Behavioral Science and Policy Association, the International Society of Political Psychology, all kind of are heavily experimental. And then, you know, within, you know, ASPA and, and within the Inter um, Public Management Research Association and within the IRSPM, there are regular panels and, um, sections that kind of focus on uh, behavioral and experimental uh, public administration. Um, I'm just going to put in this plug for our book. Uh, um, Oliver James, who's at Exeter University, Sebastian Yilka, who's now at Georgetown University, and myself, we, we um, um, edited this book, which I think is a good, you know, kind of overview of the use of experiments and public management research. It's got a couple chapters on kind of methods um, and uh, methodological kind of guidance on doing experiments. But then it's also got an interesting set of chapters that looks at the use of experiments to address particular topics in public administration, like work motivation or co-production or performance measurement or representative bureaucracy. And so it's, it's an attempt to kind of put together a, a volume, a book that, that includes both guidance on methods, but also examples of how experiments are being used to look at um, uh, particular topics within public administration. So that book was published in 2017. So it's, it's already a, a, a few years old, um, but I think it does a good job of sur surveying where, where the field was at at a kind of uh, point at which the, the experimental method was really kind of emerging. And, it's, and there's been, uh, you know, quite a lot of work since, since that book was published. So um, kind of uh, briefly a little bit about why, why experiments, um, why, why does the field of public administration need experiments? And so, so one, one main um, reason is that has to do with the limitations of um, observational studies. Um, so observational studies, as, as I'll explain shortly, are, are studies in which you just, I, mean, I think most, you know, using existing survey data or administrative data or collecting original survey data, where you're not intervening in the world, you're just sort of observing the world as it is. And, um, and th those kinds of studies are, are, are very important and, and, and remain useful to the field, but they do suffer from certain sort of limitations, one of which is common source bias, which uh, there's been a fair amount written about it by Ken Meyer and others in the field, um, which is also referred by econo to, economists typically refer to it as endogeneity bias. But the, the fact that 
it's very difficult to tease tease apart um, cause and effect with with observational data because there's a lot of underlying common causes that are 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 hard to disentangle, and um, um, a lot of those studies rely on statistical modeling, but statistical modeling alone is 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 limited in terms of its ability to address um, common source bias and endogeneity bias. So there there have been some there are there are certainly important techniques to get at that. You know the use of instrumental variables, the use of sort of propensity scores. There's all kinds of very um, ingenious kind of strategies to try to get at the kinds of bias that are are typical in observational studies. But just at some level, some of it is just inevitable. You can't get around the, um, the problem of, of um, disentangling cause and effect with, with purely observational data. Um, and so that leads to kind of, I think some, to somewhat a, a sort of a dissatisfaction in, in some parts of the field of public administration with not having solid causal evidence because um, um, some of the, like the evidence, for example, on the effects of public service motivation or the causes of public service motivation, or, you know, the, causes of co-production or the effects of co-production like some of those things are are there's there's evidence about it but it's not clear that that we have a good understanding of what is causing what and yet causal evidence is essential for public administration because it's important to know kind of what works and how 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 things work and what we what we can actually manipulate in the world and how we can intervene in administrative agencies and in public policy to produce results and to make things um, happen in the world. And so causal evidence is, I would argue, is kind of essential to the field. And yet a lot of the research methods we rely on don't provide good causal evidence. It's kind of like, you know, imagining the field of medicine, for example, which is very much an applied field. Like you want to know in medicine, what works, what medications work, what treatments work, what surgeries work, you know, what, what causes health problems. But if, if medicine relied totally on non-experimental data, we would have a very kind of weak evidence base for uh, act the actual practice of medicine. And in a sense, you can kind of say the same about public administration that we maybe have a kind of weak evidence base for the actual practice of public administration because we don't have a lot of what are often considered sort of the most rigorous kinds of evidence, at least in medicine, which is sort of randomized controlled trials or, or experiments. <clears throat> okay. But I, I, I do want to point out that um, um, experiments have limitations. Like every method has a has limitations, and so the fact that experiments, yeah, what's that? Sure. Is there a question? Or... Greg, I don't think there's a question. Just just uh, some concerns. There's two lines, highlight lines on your slides. I think they're trying to get rid of those two lines on your, oh, on your presentation. Yeah, I, don't I don't know where those come from. Hmm. Yeah, I've never seen that before. Yeah, let me I've check. Been, huh. Make I've sure no to, hackers. I've been trying to remove those lines, but I... Yeah, I don't know. Uh, Greg, I don't think it's your problem. Uh, then the one user I particularly called on, uh, Wang Tao, would you please uh, de-highlight it to see if it works? Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, hi, hi Wafang, how are you doing? Uh, actually, it's not me. Okay. Then it must be someone else. But I think that so far it doesn't affect we uh, we actually yeah, see your slides. It doesn't really doesn't really impact uh, the, the the essence of the talk. So yeah, yeah, I noticed those. I it. didn't. Uh, I don't think I drew them. But. No, it's not you. Okay, thanks, Wafang. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, right. please proceed, yeah. Greg. <laughs> so, um, well, well it'll just add a little concern. It'll let's at let's least let's add, let's add, a add a little color to my slide. So, so what I was saying. So, um, the um, so I mentioned, you know, those limitations and of, uh, of observational studies and. But it's important to, to measure to understand that experiments have limitations too. And I just I want to point this out up front because there, there is there is the sometimes there, there's the impression that oh, you know, uh, observational studies have limitations and experimental studies um, are better at proving cause and effect. So they're they're better studies, but but they're not. They're they're just 
they're they're better in some ways. They're better at proving cause and effect, but they're not better in other ways. For example, experiments are often very artificial. They're highly contrived. They're hypothetical, artificial constructs, artificial situations. Um, and importantly, like uh, um, experiments can only focus on things that the researcher can modify, like something they can manipulate. And there's lots of things in the world that you can't manipulate. Like you can't manipulate, you know, people's um, ethnic characteristics or you can't manipulate kind of real world sort of populations in lots of ways so there's plenty of things in the world that are important to study that are, are can't be manipulated directly and there's often a focus on convenience samples um, which are less representative sometimes than observational studies and there can be ethical constraints that limit what you can do experiments about so the way I think I would characterize it, there, that experiments are just one of a, of a variety of methods that are needed to understand and improve public administration. And, it, and the field should have a mix of methods. It's important to have a mix of methods. Um, but we haven't had many experiments up until recently. I mean, those of you who are young and new to the field might think that experiments are kind of, have been around forever and they're a part of the field that's always been important, but, they, but they, they're not. Like when I was, you know, starting out as a professor in public administration, no, nobody did experiments up, up until about you know, 10, 10 years ago. The journals had almost no experiments in them. And, and now it's quite much more common, which is good, but it's also um, just an addition to an already important mix of methods. <clears throat> so, so let me talk a little bit about what an experiment is. So this is uh, basic, but I think important. So, um, so an experiment is uh, contrasted with an um, experimental study is contrasted with an observational study. So in, a, in an observational study, the way I think about this is an observational study is something in which a researcher watches things happen. They observe the world, they do surveys, they collect administrative data. They just kind of track what's happening in the world and they look for patterns, they look for correlations, they look for potential cause and effect relationships, but they're just watching what's happening in the world. Whereas in an experimental study, there's a very important distinction, which is the researcher intervenes into the world, intervenes in the world in order to try to make something happen. Um, and that can be both in the lab or the field or, or whatever. So here, here's a sort of a, a, a diagram to illustrate that. So let's say you, you, we have a survey of people around the world, like the World Value Survey or something like that. And we ask people to report on the performance of the government. And then we ask them to report on the trust of the government. We look at the correlation between perceived performance of the government and reports of people's perceived you know, or people's self-reported trust in the government. We're, we're simply observing what people see in terms of government performance and how they feel about their trust of the government. And we're looking at the relationship. Well, we, we might hypothesize that there's a cause, that performance causes trust, but we're essentially just observing the co-occurrence of those two variables. And if we look at actual, you know, kind of aggregate data, if we looked at sort of performance and trust at an aggregate level, we, we'd still be just observing the world. But in, but in an experimental study, you actually try to do something to manipulate performance, you actually intervene, which is that extra arrow, um, and try to exogenously influence performance in order to see if it has a, uh, an effect on trust. And it's almost like, you know, like, like billiard balls, like in a, in, a, in a pool table or a billiard table, you try to hit one ball into another ball to see if it affects the third ball. You know, you try to produce a cause and effect chain of events by manipulating uh, the independent variable in order to see if it has an effect on a dependent variable. And, and that becomes kind of the, the real challenge of doing experiments is to find a way to take an independent variable that you're interested in and find a way to manipulate it. So let, let's say we're interested in looking at people's perception, you know, perceptions of performance and trust. Well, how would we manipulate people's perceptions of performance? Um, <clears throat> So in, in one study, one of the early, earliest experimental studies I published in the field, we manipulated form, performance like this. We, we, we showed people pictures. We showed people on the left-hand side, we showed them a picture of a New York City street. And on the right-hand side, another picture of a New York City street. The left-hand side 
is a little bit dirtier street and the right-hand side is a little bit cleaner street. And it turns out these, these photographs came from New York City's scorecard, which they used to actually rate the performance of the street cleanliness in New York City. But we did this in the context of a survey experiment. Some people got the low performance photograph, some people got the high performance photograph. So we were able to kind of manipulate that. And we said, so if, you, if your city's you know, government performance, you know, their, their performance in terms of cleaning the streets looked like this, what would your perceptions of the government be? And, and um, you know, it wasn't perfect. It's kind of artificial. It's not the real street. It's just a photograph of the street. But at least we were able to kind of manipulate the performance. So going back to this, we were able to intervene, manipulate what they were looking at performance, and then see if that had an effect on their perceptions of government. So. Um, Okay, so that's the kind of one of the most important things of an experiment. It, it's you intervene in the world to try to make something happen. But intervention alone is not sufficient. So let's, let's look at this. This is the argument for the need for the control group. So let's say we have a condition, we intervene to try to you know, address the condition, and then we look at what happens. And uh, that, that's kind of a classic uh, intervention scenario. So, so we've, you see ads like this all the time, ads on, t on, 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 on TV or ads in, in, on, on, in publications that there's a problem, like a skin problem. You apply a treatment, you intervene, you try to fix the skin problem, and then you look at it afterwards and the skin problem got better. So intervention you know, suggests cause and effect, right? So there was a, a problem, you intervened, you applied the new cream and the, and the condition got better. Um, the problem with that though, is that you don't know kind of what would have happened if you hadn't applied the treatment or the, or the, the medication or the, or the cream. So, so medicine, for example, medicine operated for a long time with that kind of, with, with this kind of design where, you know, people had a disease and then there was sort of a treatment applied like bloodletting or, or, um, or, uh, some kind of uh, uh, medication or, or some kind of uh, um, a drug was, was given and then the condition got better or got worse or whatever. Uh, but let's say the condition got better. And then the question is, oh, well, what would have happened? What would have happened anyway? Like could, could would people just have gotten better without the, without the drug or without the treatment? So there's an important issue of what's known as the counterfactual, which is what would have happened if a different course of action would have been taken or what would have happened without the treatment. And so this, this was kind of discovered like in the 1920s and 30s with um, Ronald Fisher and, and the early experimental statisticians who realized that you needed to kind of, you needed to have both uh, a group of people who were treated and a group of people who weren't treated so that you could observe both a factual, what kind of happened after the treatment and a counterfactual, what would have happened without the treatment. And, and a causal effect has been defined basically as the contrast between a factual and a counterfactual. Uh, and then, the, um, so you, you can think of that in your own life. Like what happens, you know, like you think of, well, you know, what, 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 what's the effect of moving to a new city? Like say, say you move to a new city and how is your life different? Well, you, you sometimes think about how your life is different by imagining a counterfactual. Like what would my life have been like if I had stayed in my old city. And then you compare, oh, this is what my life is like now. What would it have been like if I stayed in my old city? And then you, you, you kind of understand how, how moving to the new city caused a change in your life. So people, people engage in kind of counterfactual thinking all the time using their imaginations. Um, but in, in science or in social science, you wanna, you wanna actually use evidence about the counterfactual um, so how do, how do you observe a counterfactual? Well, you know, ideally you would have sort of a, a time machine. You could go like back in time. You could, you know, try, try a, a treatment, see what happens, go back in time and not try the treatment and see what happens. If you, if you had a, if you had a time machine, like this science fiction example, you could go back in time, try something, see what happens, go back in time, um, try something else, see what happens. And compare can compare the effects, um, but we but we don't you know have time machines. So 
what we do is we create kind of a simulation of, of what would have happened to the treatment group without the treatment. And that's the, the logic of a control group. So a control group mimics or models what would have happened to the treatment group without the treatment. And so that sets up the basic design of a randomized experiment where you, where you recruit participants, you randomly assign them into a treatment group and a control group. The treatment group gets the treatment, the control group gets nothing or they get a placebo. And then there's, you look at the outcomes and you make a comparison. And, and, and it's important to note, the logic of an experiment is very basic and kind of simple at one level, but it's also important to note what the control group is doing. The control group is trying to mimic or model what would have happened to the treatment group had it not gotten the treatment. Um, and it's sometimes called uh, the potential outcomes kind of uh, a difference. There's a potential outcome for the control group had they gotten the treatment and there's a potential outcome for the treatment group had they not gotten the treatment. And the comparison of what are sometimes known as potential outcomes to actual outcomes, which is similar to sort of the factual and the counterfactual is the, is the basic estimate of a causal effect. Um, now, what makes the control group, this gets us to the last element, what, make, what makes a control group valuable is, um, or what makes it a good model of the, of the counterfactual is random assignment. Because random assignment creates what's called statistical equivalence, that the two groups are equal on observable variables, but also unobservable variables. So if you go back to this diagram, the treatment group and control group are formed by random assignment. The flip of a coin or the you know, selection of a random number in a random number table determines who gets the treatment, who gets the control group. Because that's just a random selection, the treatment and the control group are statistically equivalent, equivalent meaning if the sample size is large enough, the means on average are the means are, 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 are tend to be kind of um, tend to be equivalent. So that statistical equivalence and it, it is very fundamental and it works on all all variables, not just observed variables, but unobserved variables. So let's say observed variables might be things like age, gender, university education, political ideology. The random assignment of treatment and control groups means that the groups start out with kind of pretty equivalent means on unobservables, but also things you wouldn't be able to measure or think to measure, like whether they like chocolate or whether their father was an inventor, or whether they grew up with a pet dog or they suffer from insom insomnia, like almost any variable, any variable really that you can think of, not just the observed variables are, are statistically equivalent. They're, they're balanced, they're equal, at least on average between the treatment and the control group. And that's the big advantage of experiments over kind of non-experimental data, because non-experimental data, if you have observed variables, you can control for them statistically, you can adjust for them, you can control for them. But the big problem with observational studies is you can't control for things that you don't know about or don't measure or don't have a good measurement of. Whereas an experiment balances the two groups or, or, or equalizes the two groups on, on not just the things that are observable, but also many things that are not observable. So that create, th those are the basic elements of an experiment. There's an intervention to try to make something happen in the world, to change X in order to observe its effect on Y. There's a control group to capture what the counterfactual would be, what would happen if you hadn't made a change to X. And then there's random assignment, which makes the control group a good mirror of what would happen to the treatment group had it not gotten the treatment. Okay, so those are the, that's the kind of the overview of the logic of an experiment. Um, and then, then it turns out, so the experiment I showed you, let me just go back up here. This, this, this experiment is, is the classic two group randomized control trial. Um, it's, it's sort of the simplest kind of experiment, but, but, but it's still a very widely used one. It's very, powerful too. Um, so, you know, all the, all the COVID vaccine trials that have been happening around the world, right? Those are, those are basically this, this simple design. You know, there's a treatment group that got the vaccine. There's a control group that didn't get the vaccine. The treatment is the vaccine and they compared the outcome, which is both, you know, um, you know, coming, you know, being infected with COVID, but also being hospitalized or even, you know, dying of COVID. So th those are, 
those are very large studies, very sophisticated, run by large, you know, you know, pharmaceutical companies or research firms or major institutes. But it's a simple, you know, two group comparison, a treatment group and a control group. So there's, there's nothing wrong with this design. This design is very powerful and used very widely. But there are variations to experiments. For example, you could have multiple arms. You could have different doses of the treatment or different types of treatment. Um, um, so, you know, you could have, you know, not just one treatment, but, you know, a, a second or third treatment compared to a control group, or you could have different levels of the, the treatment, like different doses. It's interesting in the vaccine trials, they didn't, they didn't do this. I mean, it's it, like, like we don't know, um, for example, whether some, some of the, the two dose, the two dose vaccines, whether they would have worked as well as a one dose vaccine. You know, we don't, we just don't know because they didn't test multiple doses. They only tested two dose versions of the, of the vaccine, not one dose version. So, um, uh, I mean, they had their, their good, good medical reasons for, for doing that, but, but it's interesting that um, um, some of the large clinical trials didn't try different um, doses, but that's sort of not how they work. They, they, they tend to kind of think of what's the best possible treatment and only test that versus a control group. But you could and you know test multiple doses, you could test multiple treatments. And then there are also the, there's also the possibility of having multiple factors. Like you could, um, you could test, for example, let's say uh, if you had like a, um, um, a, a study that had like uh, tested the effect of uh, a, a, like a zinc, zinc supplement for young children and, um, uh, um, and uh, um, an another vitamin supplement for the young children, um, let's say calcium and zinc, you could look, you could have a, a study which only had um, a calcium sub, su supplement, or, or an, uh, I'm sorry, like I'm, I'm thinking of a study that it wasn't zinc, it was um, and calcium, it was zinc and iron. So there's a, two supplements that were given, zinc and iron, and you could test the effect of zinc alone or iron alone or the combination of zinc and iron. So you can, so each of those would be a factor, like um, one supplement, zinc would be one factor, um, iron would be a second factor, and um, um, and the interaction of zinc and iron would be um, tested with a with a two by two design. So, so there are multiple factors sometimes, and then um, some studies are within subjects designs, meaning the same people uh, uh, get multiple treatments. Uh, there are, uh, for example, conjoint experiments where people are shown uh, random combinations of factors, but they're shown multiple versions of the combinations or what are sometimes known as factorial vignettes, which are kind of profiles or vignettes where the elements of the vignette are randomly varied, but you see multiple vignettes. And so you, you the same person evaluates multiple experimental variations. So there's between subjects and within subject designs. And then there are post-test only or pre-test, um, pre-post design. So there are questions about whether you, measure something as a pretest or only measure it as a post-test. Um, and there are even repeated measure designs where you kind of repeat the measurement multiple times after the treatment. So there's, there's lots of variations. These are just a few, but there's lots of variations in the logic of a randomized experiment. And then there's variations in the settings. Like some experiments are laboratory experiments. Um, some are field experiments. So laboratory experiments are typically conducted like in a university lab or kind of an artificial setting. Field experiments are conducted in the, um, sorry, in more real world settings with real participants. And there's a lot of survey experiments, which are experiments embedded within the instrument of a, a survey, within a survey instrument. And um, they're, um, they have certain advantages because they can have large, more representative samples, but they're also sometimes less realistic than field experiments and they're less behavioral than like laboratory experiments. So in, in our book on looking at the field of public administration, at the time we wrote the book, um, survey experiments were the most common followed by lab experiments and field experiments, which are about equivalent. Uh, there, um, I haven't said much about natural and quasi experiments. There's a whole nother 
literature and probably a whole nother talk about kinds of studies that resemble experiments, but that occur in the natural, you know, in it on their own or are kind of quasi-experimental, meaning they're kind of experimental, but lack randomization. Um, we, we included some of those that we looked at it. Hey, Greg. Yes. So uh, since you are talking about randomization, we do have a question from, uh, from Wang Tao here. I will, I will read the question to you. Okay. So I'll give you a time to, to, to take a sip of the water here. So uh, a question about statistical equivalence. Do we yeah. need to test st statistical equivalence after experiments? Say whether gender education are randomized between treatment and control. Moose 2011 suggests no, but there are other scholars suggesting yes. Yeah, so that's a good, that's a really good question. So I think uh, maybe I can go back up to the I'm look, looking at this. This is sometimes called a balance table. I mean, this is kind of I made it made up the unobservable variables. But the question is whether you know kind of I, I, whether you should test for statistical equivalent. I think a, a lot of journals like to see. I would say a lot of journals and a lot of reviewers like to see a balance table. They like to see evidence that the treatment and the control group are similar. It's partly a, a check on whether the randomization was uh, uh, successful. There could be kind of problems with the randomization or there could be attrition or kind of other issues that make the treatment group and control group uh, make the control group unbalanced. But the, um, I think what the, what the question is getting at is like what, what to make, if, if there's not, I th there's a big debate. The thing is, by chance, by chance, there can be some differences, you know, even if randomization is done properly, there can be some differences. Like if you think about it, if you, if you, you know, if you test 20 differences at the 5% significant level, you know, just by chance, maybe one, one out of those 20 differences could emerge statistically significant. And then what to do about that. Um, I think the, the question is, I think reporting, reporting the, co the comparison is good, but the question is what to do about it if you find like one or two in sig uh, slightly significant kind of differences. Um, I think I, I would kind of agree with the argument that you, you, shouldn't, um, you shouldn't worry about that if it's not an extreme difference and if it's not beyond what you would expect from chance. But there's a lot of debate about what to do with imbalance, like the use of control variables. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then th there's variation in the participants of an experiment. Like there are, um, you know, some experiments are done with students, some are done with the general public citizens. So, some experiments in public administration are done with public workers, of course. And that's been increasingly common with uh, nurses and teachers or police officers. Um, Higher level public managers have been part of experiments in public administration, even politicians. Um, our, our look at the literature found that most experiments were done with general populations, citizens, students, probably because they're convenient, are the next um, most common kind of sample. And actually managers are, are relatively rarely studied, at least at the time we published our book. Um, but one thing I should mention about student samples, if, if student samples are from like graduate programs, master's programs, where the students are, are, are going into public management or, or, or may even be practitioners already, that they can actually be quite, I think, quite realistic samples because they can be, you know, they're older students who are, have some work experience or at least are, are about to go into the, you know, into public service and they can be a pretty good realistic uh, proxy for actual um, practicing public managers. Okay, so um, just a few pieces of advice on conducting and publishing experiments. Um, so um, I'm gonna just mention a few things. So I'm gonna talk about some issues of the design of experiments, particularly the treatment and the outcome variable, a little bit about software for experiments, where to find participants, uh, issues of analysis, and then some challenges of publishing experiments. Because I know many of you are probably um, participating in this talk today because you're interested in doing experiments. So these, these are some ideas or things I've learned over the years um, and I, I can share those with you. 
Um, so one, one, one thing I've noticed is that the treatment, that it's very important to pay attention to the treatment. That's the thing you're manipulating, the independent variable. And there's some real issues sometimes with the design of the treatment. For example, there's sometimes a lack of construct validity, meaning does the, does the treatment really represent the theoretical construct? Um, so I think you, you've got to really think carefully about what, what your theory is and what, what you're manipulating and kind of how to manipulate it. Um, so um, the, um, the, uh, the design of the treatment is um, uh, needs to be kind of an accurate reflection of the th of the th theoretical variable you're trying to manipulate, and then there's also the the, the concern about what's called the lack of uh, mundane realism. Mundane, real mundane realism means that your your treatment does your treatment resemble the real world, and and one way to do this is to think about think about using real information in your experiments, like using real uh, press releases or using real government information or using real statistics in your in your experiment because it, it could be there could be ways there can be ways to kind of use real government information and real descriptions of programs and test them in experimentally rather than kind of making things up you know and 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 then they're therefore kind of sacrificing this kind of mundane realism and then another thing I've noticed in, in experiments is often people design experiments that I that I think are too complex sometimes. They're, so what I mean by that is there can be too many words or too many changes in the word, like between the treatment groups and the control groups, you can have too many sort of things going on that are changing. You can, you can have too many words, too many numbers, too many images. Experiments are much more convincing when you're manipulating just one clear thing. Like the, you know, I, I've done some experiments on representative bureaucracy and just changing the description of the, um, like we did some experiments where we just changed the name of the official from a male name to a female name. That was the only thing that changed in the whole description. So we weren't manipulating a lot of words. We weren't manipulating a lot of numbers. We were just changing the name of the official from a male name to a female name and just seeing how that influenced how people you know kind of judge the program um, and also you got to be careful i mentioned there are factorial experiments you got to be sometimes i think be careful of having too many factors because factors are great because they let you look at many different things but they can be, be add complexity and kind of make the analysis and interpretation more difficult so that's the independent variable and then there's some problems with the dependent variable to be uh, careful of. So some of the issues to worry about with the dependent variable or the outcome variable is having the wrong dependent variable. You got to make sure that just like you have to have the right kind of accurate uh, treatment or independent variable, you have to have the right precise dependent variable. So you have to think really carefully, does your, does your manipulation, does it affect, um, does it affect, you know, trust in government or does it affect people's satisfaction with government or does it affect their willingness to kind of cooperate with government i mean think think very carefully about what what outcome is most important i mean like with the vaccine studies they had to think very carefully what what outcomes they were looking at is it is it disease is it hospitalization is it death i mean and it's possible to look at multiple things but you got to be you got to think really carefully what's the intervention designed to, to do what's the, what's the outcome that's most relevant to the inter intervention, and then um, and be careful of having too many dependent variables because you don't want to just throw in the kitchen sink. You don't want to throw in everything because if you have too many dependent variables, um, they can kind of interfere with each other, and especially in sort of survey experiments. And there's the problem of also sort of just um, kind of hoping for some some result that turns out um, by asking lots of different dependent variables but it's much better i think to think really carefully and only have only have a few a few very carefully chosen dependent variables and then there's a bit of a debate about manipulation checks i think a lot of people a manipulation check is a question that comes after the treatment that kind of asks people did they notice the treatment or did they uh, 
you know, remember the treatment. And they can be helpful sometimes, but, but they're not always appropriate. And people are, people are sometimes influenced by things that they don't notice or don't remember. So there's a whole literature on sort of subconscious or unconscious influences and on, on sort of um, um, on, on anchoring and, and cueing effects that, that people aren't aware of. So, so don't be careful that um, not, to, not to mix, um, not to overly rely on manipulation checks. I think sometimes they're, they're overused. Um, okay, and then there's some, I'll just kind of briefly go through this because um, uh, I want to save some time at the end for questions, but there's various software platforms you can use for experiments. So for survey experiments, the Qualtrics and SurveyMonkey, kind of the big survey software, Lime, Lime Survey and others, um, they, they all include randomization functions that allow you to do experiments. Not all survey software does, but, you, but the better programs include randomization features that allow you to do experiments. There's also more specialized software for doing more sophisticated experiments like uh, Gorilla and In Inquisit and Z-Tree. Uh, Z-Tree is more for kind of um, economic games. Um, and then, but, but keep in mind that you don't need software necessarily to do experiments. You can do simple lab experiments without software, just randomize people to task A and task B. Um, field experiments often don't don't rely on software. You just you know you you do things in the field that that um, that uh, where randomization happens more kind of um, manually in a sense. Um, so um, there's no requirement that experiments need software, but particularly for surveys or kind of lab experiments, software is often used. And then where to find participants. I think students can make a good sample, particularly graduate students who are gonna be public or nonprofit managers. There are many public and nonprofit organizations that are willing to participate in surveys and other kinds of research that could lend itself to experimentation. Um, there's a whole industry of commercial research panels, uh, Qualtrics and YouGov, for example, that, that help you recruit people for experiments, especially online survey experiments. Um, many of you know, uh, Amazon MTurk has emerged as a kind of an important inexpensive platform for running experiments with general populations. And there's a company called Cloud Research, which has tried to make those samples better, better quality. There's a, a new company called Prolific that, that tries to uh, recruit people for online experiments. And then social media is being used increasingly to conduct experiments. Because you can, for example, randomly present different form, different types of ads or different announcements on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram um, and conduct uh, kind of field experiments through social media by randomizing different um, um, uh, advertisements that you uh, um, uh, program into those, into those, those platforms. So um, I've only got a, I just want to wrap up in the next like five minutes. So let me, let me just point out a few issues with uh, the analysis of experiments. Because um, they're, the analysis of experiments in some ways is pretty straightforward because you have a control group and a treatment group and you compare them and you make conclusions. But there are some cautions. You have to be careful uh, with the dummy variables in, 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 in experimental analysis. Um, I can say more about that, but a lot of researchers in public administration are used to doing a regression analysis and often kind of test experimental results using dummy variables in a regression analysis framework. And that, that turns out to work out in, in straightforward two group comparisons, but when you have factorial designs it can lead to sometimes misleading results. And I, I have a, a short little paper about that on the Social Science Research Network about the mistakes that can be made with the regression analysis of factorial experiments. Um, um, there's there's a, a lot of questions sometimes about the use of control variables. We're, we're, I think many of us are used to using control variables. We use control variables all the time in all of our other studies, so why not use them here? Uh, but often in experiments don't need control variables, uh, especially given proper randomization. And the better way to think about it is not in terms of control variables, because by design, 
like, as I mentioned, there's statistical equivalence between the treatment group and the control group. So you don't need control variables in the usual sense to kind of deal with confounding because you, by design, you don't, you don't have confounding, but you should think in terms of covariates, which, which means like variables that predict the dependent variable that have, have strong predictive power of the dependent variable. And that can be used to strengthen the kind of statistical power of the experiment. And I, I could say a bit more about that, but it's like the idea of using a pretest as a covariate in, a, in, a, in an analysis, because the pretest does a good job of predicting the post test. And that gives you statistical power for testing the independent variable. But that's a different way of thinking than control variables. Covariates are not confounding variables, they're variables that only predict y, they're not confounded with x. And so uh, another issue is to pay attention to effect size. Other, you know, that's true of all research that there tends to be sometimes an over-reliance on statistical significance. It's important to think about the effect size. How large of an effect is it? Is it practically important? Is it policy relevant? So effect size can be reported using standardized um, values for Y, or you can report percentage changes. Those are good basic ways to kind of say in, in practical terms, how much is, is the experimental effect. Um, uh, moderators are another uh, issue. A lot of uh, studies, experimental studies will look at subgroups or interaction effects. Um, I think that can, that can be great, but you gotta have to be careful sort of with potentially mining the data or looking for um, fishing for statistical significance in a way. So you want to distinguish confirmatory, meaning like subgroup analysis you had in advance versus exploratory analysis, which you're doing just to look for patterns and, and, and avoid, you know, p-hacking, avoid sort of just running analysis in order to find significance. And then there's some interesting missing data problems in experiments. And one, one thing to avoid is avoid dropping cases based on the manipulation check. I think that sometimes happens too often where people only look at people who pass the manipulation check, which can be a little deceiving sometimes. So at least, at least show it both ways, show the full, full sample. Um, don't be careful dropping cases. Cause if you, particularly if you're dropping cases based on some variable after the treatment, it can, it can bias the result and kind of ruin the advantage you have from randomization. And then just in terms of challenges in publishing, um, it's sometimes difficult to know how many experiments to put into an article. Sometimes one experiment is enough, but often you need several experiments to, to really constitute an article. It can be difficult to publish null findings if you don't find an effect. Um, but one way around that is to pre-register the study and have um, good design. So uh, pre-registration is important and increasingly the open science movement is important. And um, uh, it can be difficult to publish a replication, but yet replications are important. Uh, but that's changing a bit because there's more, I think, recognition of the importance of replication. And then um, editors and reviewers in public administration, there's still a lot of them are not familiar with experiments. So you may get reviews that, that don't um, fully kind of um, respond to the, the issues of an experiment, but this is changing because I think a lot of people are now doing more experiments and they, they know more about them than they did in the years, a few years ago. Um, I won't say too much about this, but there, there's a also related to experimental research, there's a whole movement of open science, which is encourages pre-registration. In other words, stating your hypotheses in advance and registering them in a, in a, a website where you document um, time, time stamp the, the hypotheses. There's a movement to make the materials open, to make the data open. I, I would highly recommend the Open Science Framework website. It's a great website to use for learning kind of how to do experiments using kind of an open science approach. Okay, so I think I've taken up my, my whole time right now. I just wanna leave the last you know 10 or 12 minutes for any questions or comments, I'd be happy to talk more about any of these issues or, or address other things that I didn't cover. <laughs>